Amen. The Lord is good. He's here in this place with us right now. He's here in this place. You know, where God's people gather in his name, he promised to show up. When the Lord shows up and you're ready for it, you're going to receive some good things. You're going to receive some good things today in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is week two of our Hearing from God series. This message is called Preparing to Meet with God. Hearing from God is, is about listening. About listening. Too many times in our lives, we don't leave space. We don't clear our, our minds to be able to hear from God. Because we're so busy doing, doing, doing. And we've all got a lot of things to do this week in this year, and every day. And, but unfortunately, all the things we've got to do, do, do can get in the way of listening to God. And so we want to, we want to call on our church to be able to hear from God. And every day of this series, we're asking ourselves, I'm challenging our church to ask ourselves, every one of you to ask, God, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? And so we're going to start this message today. It's called Preparing to Meet with God. It's from Nehemiah chapter 2. You know, some meetings in your life are a phenomenal waste of time. Anybody ever been part of those meetings? Okay. Yeah, I've got a book by Patrick Lencioni, and it's called Death by Meeting, and it's for the corporate world. And he wrote the book to go, man... Death by meeting. Meetings don't have to be that bad, but most of them are. And some of them are this amazing waste of time. And you go, man, that was just a waste of time. While others, other meetings, there's much fewer of them, but there are other meetings that they hold the key to changing your life. There's some meetings that you have in life that it sets you on a course where your tra the tra trajectory of your life shifts and you go and you soar. You know, either way, whether you love meetings or you hate meetings, meetings have become the basis for modern business and global politics. In the church world, meetings are important as well. And, you know, some meetings... You remember every detail of them. I can remember the day I met my wife. Man, that meeting was powerful. That meeting was powerful. I can tell you the day, the circumstances, the conversations. Some meetings contain such a level of significance that they forever become etched in our psyche. Let me tell you about a meeting when Steve met Steve in 1971. The founders of Apple Incorporated met in 1971 when Steve Wozniak was in college and Steve Jobs was still in high school. In an interview from 2007, Wozniak is quoted as saying, A friend said, you should meet Steve Jobs. He likes electronics and he also plays good pranks. That meeting has subsequently brought us some of the world's most desirable technology and changed the ways in which we communicate forever. Nehemiah had a meeting. He had a meeting with his boss, the king of Persia, in Nehemiah chapter 2. And that meeting would have the kind of impact that impacts a whole generation and a whole nation. This meeting could have gone terribly wrong that Nehemiah had. Could have gone terribly wrong if the king perceived Nehemiah's request to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem as treasonous. And he could have. He very well could have. See, here's how it had gone. Jerusalem, where Nehemiah was from, was attacked by the Assyrian Empire which was at that time the most powerful empire on the planet. It was before the Greek Empire. It was before the Roman Empire. And it was even before the Persian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was a global force that dominated the region. And 
They had conquered Jerusalem, not burned the walls and taken the people captive. And this was something that was prophesied. The Lord said, because you've disobeyed me, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be captives for 70 years. And it happened. God just used the Assyrians to accomplish his will. You see, at the end of the day, global forces... God is orchestrating circumstances that he'll use even godless people to accomplish great things that he wants to get done, even today in our world. And if it, it, you, you could have been in Nehemiah's day and you could have missed that. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow these terrible people to take God's people captive? And you know what? Today you might be going, why does God allow that to happen? And you'd be missing that God's at work in the world today. God is at work. And I want to say that Nehemiah, this, this, this meeting, he was meeting with the ruler of Persia. The ruler of the Persian Empire had conquered the Assyrian Empire. So it was the Assyrians who conquered Jerusalem. And then the Persians conquered the Assyrians. And this is the ruler of the Persian Empire. Artaxerxes is his name. I don't know why his parents named him that. But I bet, I bet his whole life he went through asking him, why did you name me Artaxerxes? Well, you just call me Art for short or something like that. So, so Nehemiah goes to the king of Persia. who came, Nehemiah was his cupbearer, and Nehemiah was, 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 was a close confidant. And, and in this meeting we've got in, in, in chapter two of Nehemiah, it could have gone really bad because Nehemiah was, in his heart, he had learned about, about how bad things were back home in Jerusalem and, 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 and how, how, how deflated the people of Jerusalem were because, because um, their, their, their walls are in ruins and, and they could be subject to invaders coming in and they were and they couldn't, they couldn't have anything good because it would be like It'd be like having a house and, and, and you're like, well, I got, I got something, some, some great art for my house and I don't have walls to hang it on. And so I'll just kind of leave it sitting there and anybody who sees it could take it. That was kind of how Jerusalem was, lying in ruins. And Nehemiah went to the king in chapter 2. And I, I just want to want to read verse 1 for you of Nehemiah chapter 2. It's verse 1. It says, in the month of Nisan... This is on the Jewish calendar. In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. And now I had not been sad in his presence before. I had not been sad in his presence before. I want to point out a couple of things about this situation. That Nehemiah, though he had a tremendous burden on his heart to rebuild Jerusalem, to go back to his city of origin, to, 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 to encourage his people, to lift him up. He had this tremendous burden, and he met with God about it. We talked about this last week. Nehemiah, when he heard about Jerusalem, he mourned, he cried, he fasted and he prayed. He went to God. He was prayed up and prepped up. And, and, and in this meeting, he goes before the king and, and, the, and he notes that the king had not seen me sad before. This is the first time I'm sitting in the presence of the king and I'm sad. And, and I'm not hiding my sadness either. I'm not going to put on a smiley face and pretend that everything's okay. I'm going to be real, Nehemiah says. And, and, and so, so Nehemiah, he serves. It was his responsibility. He goes to the king. And, and I want to say this about sadness. Pay attention to the things that you're sad about. Pay attention to what, what, what causes you to mourn, what causes you to grieve, because that's the thing that you need to meet God about. That's the thing that you need to meet God about. You know what I'm saying? There was an opportunity Opportunity was about to show her beautiful face to Nehemiah. And, 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 and to, I want to say this, that too many Christians underestimate the significance and the power of meeting with the Almighty. Too many Christians underestimate the significance and the power of meeting with the Almighty. When was your last meeting with God? When was your last significant meeting with God? 
Man, I'm telling you, yesterday we had a prayer walking on here, on here on our campus, and a bunch of us had some significant encounters with God yesterday. If you weren't here, man, I know you, you guys had responsibilities and stuff like that. Those of you who were here, you know it was powerful. And, and those of you who missed it, man, I hope you get an opportunity to do this sometime soon. The next one we're going to do is in a couple of weeks, the next prayer walking event. And I would encourage you to come. Talk to some of those people who were here yesterday and, and ask them about it because it was powerful. And the first thing I want you to notice about when Nehemiah heard about things back home is that when he heard about Jerusalem, he took that as a message from God. When Nehemiah heard about how things were bad in Jerusalem, he took that as a message from God. The Lord was pulling Nehemiah into something big and into something bold. When God pulls you in, you got to go. Touch someone next to you and tell them, I've got a meeting with God. When we fail to see the importance of meeting, starting with meeting with God, we don't seek out the meeting. When we fail to seek out the, the, the meeting with someone in our lives, there could be someone that in your life that you need to seek a meeting with. There could be someone that could help you along because they got some things to teach you. And, 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 and if you don't seek out the meeting, you'll never experience the value of that meeting. And, and you don't seek it out because you fail to see the, the importance of it. You fail to see the significance of it. You fail to see the value of it. Because if you see something as valuable, you go for it. Right? Right? When God orchestrates a meeting with you, it's going to have lasting effects. When God orchestrates a meeting with you, it's going to touch souls. It's going to challenge lives. It's going to break strongholds. It's going to reach into the future. Are you with me? Amen. Life will get better every time you meet with God. When you meet with God, when you make space, when you meet with God, you don't just go, I pray a prayer before I sit down and eat. Rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. That's not meeting with God you got to make some space to meet with God. you got to make some space. And I've got to I I make you notice this, that, that Nehemiah, Nehemiah was bold. It is striking to me that Nehemiah did not stop God and say, but why, not me, Lord, not me. Nehemiah did not stop God and say, why me? He was not like Moses. Moses did that. And Moses was used by God. But check out Nehemiah. The starting place of Nehemiah was not, Lord, why me? He had a sense of boldness and service. Following God is the kind of thing that requires big, beautiful boldness. Are you with me on this? You don't have to be loud to be bold. But you do need resoluteness like Nehemiah had. He was ready to die. Nehemiah was ready to die to make this happen because he knew that what he was about to do was worthwhile. He knew that what he was about to do was worthwhile. You know what? You guys get a treat that you didn't even know that we're, Brian and I are doing some tag team preaching and Brian's going to bring the next part of this message to you. Listen, we're in this series talking about... Oh, I didn't get a tag. Here we go. I'm ready now. We're in a series talking about the reality of what we're called to do, who we're called to be. And the thing is about it is, how can you know and go if you don't want to listen to what people want to tell you to go to? We have to have an understanding that we're here to listen to God, and God is going to move and direct us and guide us into where he wants us to go. The thing about this is, when you have this prophet Nehemiah, right, as pastor spoke, there's a boldness. He had already met with God before he met with the king. In verses 2 through 5, he said this, he said, And the king said to me, Why is your face sad? He knew Nehemiah had never had this look on his face before. So you are, you are not sick, he said. There is nothing but sadness of the heart. Here's what Nehemiah said at the end of that verse. Then I was very much afraid. Verse 3 said, and, the, and he said to the king, Let the king live forever. 
Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's grave, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Verse 4 says, And the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Verse 5, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has been found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's grave, that I may rebuild it. Have you ever came in your life when you're preparing for God, right? Preparing to hear from God that you run into this crossroad? Will you run into the intersection where faith meets doubt? Where there's a conflict that's going on? Who should I follow? Where should I go? I know everybody here was on their way to faith and doubt just crept in. There's a boldness about Nehemiah. There's a boldness of why he said what he wanted to do and how God wanted to tell him to go. But we find that correlation over in the New Testament. In the Great Commission in Matthews, the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20, get this. It's only 11 of his disciples following him. He said, now the 11, in verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Get this, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. That's the crossroad between faith and doubt. But they, they walked with this guy. They seen it. One of the things you have to understand is they hung around this guy. Now he's on the resurrection trail like we're going to celebrate next Sunday. Okay? And then Jesus came in verse 18 said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. 20, teaching them to deserve all, observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of age. Here's the thing. When we're talking about having that crossroad, the intersection between faith and doubt. Faith, belief in something or someone who has power to grant your request. When you know the person knows your very thoughts, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. They know everything about you. They know you better than you know yourself. The king knew something was up with Nehemiah. Some of us, like Nehemiah, have a boldness, as the pastors say, in our belief, and then the, and then the, have a belief in them and their power and authority that those people in control can grant us our very requests. What separates the fearless faithful from the dreaded doubtful? Was Nehemiah more faithful than any of us, anyone in his time? How about the disciples when we just said when Jesus was about to commission them, they had some doubt. There may be someone here today that is at the crossroad between the intersection of faith and doubt. You love this church. This place of worship, the people, the fellowship, or whatever keeps bringing you back here week after week. But not entirely sure of what God's purpose is. What's the church thing all about? Where are we going? Who is telling us that we need to do what God wants us to do and level these buildings and do what God has called us to do? Crossroad, the intersection between faith and doubt. There's a choice Nehemiah had to make, right? But get this. I want to ask the question. What's the difference between Nehemiah or the disciples who didn't doubt Jesus? What's the difference between the faith of our pastor, pastor right here, and somebody sitting here today that's not sure about this whole God and church thing that we're about to do? What's the difference? You know what the difference is? None. There's no difference. We serve the same God. We have his same spirit running in us. We're all his people, his children. None. Why? Because in the case of Nehemiah, the king knew him. Nehemiah was afraid, but he still made his request to the king. Some of the disciples doubted. But get this, it states in Matthew 28, 17, when they saw him, pastor, they worshiped him. Here's the thing about worshiping God. Even though some doubted, all worshiped and all were commissioned. You may be at a crossroad, the intersection of faith and doubt. But remember, Jesus is king and Lord of all, and God will always remain faithful and grant your request. 
You may be at that crossroad. But here's what you got to understand. Jesus never stopped, wor- Je- just never, just never stopped worshiping. Keep praising God in every situation, especially when you're at that crossroad, the intersection of faith and doubt. Thank you, Brian. Brian Ennis is part of our teaching team and love it that we get to, we have a team of three of us and Jim Parsons and Jim's, Jim's out there. He's setting this one out, but he'll be back again soon. So when you think about this, what Brian's talking about with this intersection between faith and doubt, in our church, we're at such an intersection right now. We're at such an intersection. As Nehemiah moved out, in verse, verse, starting with verse 6, I want to I wanna look at this, starting with verse 6, I'll read verses 6 through 8. And the king said to me, the, king, the queen said him beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors of the province, to me, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, the hand of God. The hand of my God was upon me. Man, there's something here. This is, this is important. Check this out. Nehemiah had the audacity. Nehemiah had the boldness to ask this king that had, had, had over, he, the king oversaw these conquered peoples. And he had the audacity to ask, king, I know, I know that they conquered Jerusalem. And I know Jerusalem represents a, 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 another, another country that was a, a threat to this region that was a power in itself. But I want to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Will you give me permission to go back and rebuild uh, 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 Jerusalem? And not only that, will you give me time off with pay to go back and rebuild Jerusalem? And not only that, will you give me permission, letters with your seal on it, that when I go through the lands and all these other governors, that I can show them I have permission from the king. Look at the king's seal to do this. And not only that, king, will you provide me all of the resources to rebuild my country? Will you give me all the resources? And not only that, will you give me everything I need to build me the house that I'm going to live in? Is there some bold people of God in here anywhere? We need boldness, people. We need boldness in the name of Jesus. For some of you, you don't make time for meetings because the meetings don't matter. You're, not, you're just thinking about yourself doing your own thing. You don't need to meet with anybody. You're all good on your own. For some reason, you are content to go about your business and do your own thing. Maybe you think that your time is not worth meeting with anybody. Maybe you think that you don't have anything to offer anyone else. Maybe you think that the meeting isn't worth your time. Maybe you've become cynical about what can become of the meeting. But I'm here to tell you, your next meeting could change your life. Your next meeting could change your life. And it could have a deep impact on somebody else. If people do not seek meetings with you, then be the kind of person who seeks meetings with other people. I got something I want to learn from that person. That person has something I want to learn. I need to spend some time with this guy, this woman, this person, because I want to learn some things. There's some people who have the kind of effect of encouraging, of lifting up, of inspiring greatness. Some people have that effect. And you love to be around those kind of people. Those kind of people is who you need to be around. You don't need to be around people who are going to drag you down. You don't need to be around people who are going to put you down. You don't need to be around people who are going to discourage you. There's some people that you just need to be able to go, you know what? I'm glad I know that person, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with that person. There's some people in your own family like that. Man, that's unfortunate. 
But there's some people in your own family that you go, you know what? We're related by, love, by blood, and I love that person. I love that person. I love this person. But I am not seeking out meetings with that person. I am not going to spend time with that person. Because truly, every time I'm around that person, I feel like they discourage me. I feel like they deflate me. I feel like they take the wind out of my sails. You don't need to be around those kind of people. You don't need to be around them. You can still love them, but you don't need to be hang out with them. And I want to encourage you guys that seek the meeting with the person who you will learn from. Seek the meeting with the person who, you will, who will lift you up. Learn all you can from a great person. Ask questions of this phenomenal person. And aspire to be like this worthy person. As soon as you find, or soon you will find, that you're becoming the kind of person that people want to have meetings with. And you need to be that kind of person. And you, I want to tell you this. Meetings. <laughs> you know, are you worth meeting? Are you worth the time? Yeah. Somebody spend time with you? Yeah. Are you worth the time? Yeah. If someone wants to seek out that meeting with you? Are they going to benefit from their time with you? You know what I'm saying? Think about that. Well, let me tell you this. Your worth is not measured by how much value you place on yourself. Your worth is not measured, measured by how much value you place on yourself. Your worth is measured by God. And I'm telling you, God wants to meet with you. God wants to meet with you. The creator of the universe wants to meet with you. And that is something. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, God wants to meet with me. People have victory. We've got some questions. We've got some doubts going on in our lives right now. We've got some doubts going on. We've got a big project in front of us. And we've got some things going on with that project that, that requires some faith, that requires some boldness, that requires some belief. But you know what? There's some doubt going on. You know, some of us are asking, what if it fails? What if this fails? We're selling this land. We're raising some money. We're bringing on the learning group as a partner. We're doing an internal fundraising campaign that we're raising some money to put our own skin in the game. What if it fails? Some of us are asking, what will happen to the money we commit if the capital campaign of the project doesn't go through? What happens if the businesses aren't successful? What if a school that we're about to start does, isn't successful? What if the, the event center isn't successful? What happens to the money we raise if it isn't enough to do the project? What happens to it? And you know what? I know some of you are asking those questions. Those are doubt questions. I know some of you are asking that question. But you know what I'm concerned about? at that intersection between doubt and faith, there's some faith questions. You know what? You know, there's some faith questions that need to be asked. And, and, and I need to hear those faith questions from you. You know what the faith questions? I'm thinking about the faith questions and the doubt questions. You know what I'm saying? But here's some faith questions. What could happen if we raise more than our goal? What will we do if we grow out of our new space? Amen. What are all the ways that I can get involved today with this project? When can we start building? Who should, be, who should we be praying for today, right now? What do we need to get to go? To, what do we need to get where we want to go? What resources do we need? Nehemiah, with boldness, asked the king for everything he needed. Amen. With boldness. And moving on, check this out. Nehemiah got some permission. He got some permission. I'm going to go into verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with 
officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanbalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. Now, I don't know who named these people again. I don't know who named these people. Sanbalat. I'm just going to call you Sani, okay? <laughs> Toby, there you go. Sani and Toby, there we go. So when Sani and Toby heard of this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. They did not like that something was going to happen for Israel. They did not like that Nehemiah showed up to rebuild the walls. They did not like that those people were going to thrive again. They did not like that thought. And, and I, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Nehemiah had, had permission, and he had the acquisition of the resources, and, 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 and they were the beginning of a difficult season for Nehemiah. And then he set out on the journey to Jerusalem, and guess what? He didn't have to look for enemies. The first thing that happened, enemies arose. When you start doing something for God, enemies will arise. When you start doing something great, enemies will arise. When you rise up, when you rise up and you say, I believe and I'm going to go, people will rise up and say, no, you can't. No, you won't. No, you didn't. There are a lot of haters out there that are going to go that route with you. They're all over the place. This world is full of them. This world is full of them. And so you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about whether they're going to come. They're going to come. They're going to show up, and they're going to stand against you. Anything you want to do, you want to do something great for your family, the enemies will rise up against you. You want to do something great in your business, enemies will rise up. You want to do something great in your neighborhood for your city, enemies will rise up. Church, you want to do something great like we're about to do, enemies will rise up. Enemies will rise up. And, and, and I want to I call us, I want to tell this, I want to tell you this. You know, I want to give you three reasons why I believe that victory will succeed in this endeavor we're about to walk into. Three reasons. One, the leaders who are at the center of this vision are committed to making it a reality. Amen. Myself, Josh Malaputi, our church board, Leaders in our church are committed to making this a reality. I'm confident that we will get there. Yeah. We, and, then, and then secondly, secondly, theologically, I know that God expects a good return on his investment. Amen. God expects a good return on his investment, ROI. God expects whatever he puts in your hands to be delivered as a significant improvement on his investment. I'm telling you what. I don't know how many of you were here at the founding of this church in 1956. I don't know how many of you were there and put some dollars on the table and put some faith on the table and said, we're going to help start a church right there at 227 North Magnolia Avenue in 1956. I don't know how many of you were there, but I'm telling you, there was a previous generation that was there, and they believed, and they went for it. Today, we're the beneficiaries of what they believed. Today, we're the beneficiaries. We were handed what they invested in then. And there's too many years that have gone by without remodeling and improvements of these facilities, and we're done with these facilities, and thank God for them. But you know what? This fresh start requires some newness. And we're going for that newness. We're going to build on that newness. And we're going to go through the opposition for that newness. I want to say this. God expects us what we've been handed that we need to multiply. When I stand before God one day and he says, David Lanto, what did you do as pastor of Victory Baptist Church? What did you do as pastor of that congregation for those years that you were there? You're the fourth pastor in that church's 65-year history. What did you do? Where did you lead them? Where did you go? I'm not going to stand before God and say, well, you know, hey, I just kind of <laughs> sailed by and we just kind of kept going until we were smooth sailing and, you know, we just used the same buildings and we just kind of tried to keep the same. No way! I'm going to say, Lord, I went to take new territory away from the kingdom of hell. Lord, I went to stand in opposition against dark forces. Lord, I went to lead those people into new territory. Lord, I went to bring those people to believe. Amen. And I pulled them together in your name. And look what we did. Lord, people were saved. 
People came to faith. Lives were changed. Families, families, broken families became whole again. Marriages were realigned with God. Man, people overcame addictions. Lord, people were reunited. Can you see it? Can you believe it? Opposition is going to arise. The third thing. We have a team of consultants who have helped us put together our plan. It is a great plan, and we're, we're putting it in action. It's happening. It's happening, guys. It's happening. Believe it. Opposition is coming. When it comes, we can't control it, but I'm going to tell you this. You know, good old Albert Einstein, he, said, he once said this. Great spirits have always encountered violent oppositions from mediocre minds. You know what I'm saying? All right, Albert, preach it. (laughs) Preach it. You know what? I'm going to tell you this. It's your time. It's your time. When they judge you, it's your time to be gracious. When they envy you, it's your time to be humble. When they misunderstand you, it's your time to be clear in communication. When they underestimate you, oh, when they underestimate you, it's your time to be powerful. When they condemn you, it's your time to live set free. When they oppose you, it's your time to prevail. Say to somebody, it's my time. time. Say it again, it's my time. Amen. Amen. You know, as, as, when, we, when we hear a message, we do this thing where we call my next steps. And we want to take some steps in obedience to God. Listening to what God says and following him in obedience. And, and, and so, so we have some next steps that we put on your bulletin. In your bulletin, you have them on the sermon notes page. That's for you to keep on the sermon notes page. Now, on the back of the response card that we worked with earlier, fill that one out. You're going to turn that one in. And in a moment, our ushers are going to come forward and, and, and take our offering, and you, you'll be able to turn in your response form into the offering plate. But let's, let's walk through for, for just a couple of minutes these next steps. First, I will ask the question each day of the Hearing from God series, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? Ask that question every day. Wake up. When you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, our church is doing something. What would you have me do? Lord, I'm ready. Lord, it's my time. What do you want me to do? That's my timer saying, Dave, stop preaching. (laughs) Second, I will pray the prayer, Lord, guide me to know your will for this community and form me to carry it out. Because you know what? You're meant to have an impact on your community. You are meant for it, and you're empowered for it. You've got what it takes, and we are the church, and let's have an impact on our community. You know that this, this, this Saturday, this event that we're having, this meet your neighbor extravaganza, and, and this, is, this is for neighbors to come here and gather on our property and just meet people. We just want to be the place where people can meet on Saturday. And so we're inviting a bunch of neighbors. Will you invite your neighbors? Will I, can I ask you to stop by that resource table? Stop by that resource table, every one of you, and pick up a stack of 10, 15, 20, 25 of those cards and make sure you hand them out this week. Those cards, those invite cards are for Easter. All of Easter weekend, we have three things going on. Good Friday service, Friday night. Saturday, the Meet Your Neighbor extravaganza. And Sunday, we have two worship services going on. It's going to be a jam-packed Easter weekend at Victory. Will you join us for it? Will you bring some neighbors to it? Will you invite your friends and family to it? Please stop by, pick up 25 of those cards, Get them handed out to people within five miles of this congregation this week. People you work with, people in your neighborhood, people in these neighborhoods, go start handing them out, even if you put them on doorsteps in neighborhoods. Third, what aspects of God's character is he seeking to develop in me? When God wants to meet with you, he wants to form you in Christ-likeness. What aspects of his character does he want to form you in? You need to identify that. You need to identify that between you and God. Spend some time with God 
and figure out, how does God want to form you this week? How does God want to form you this year, change you and grow you in his name? And then lastly, I will not be deterred by those who stand against me. I will not be deterred by those who stand against me. Jose, will you come and take our offering? Uh-huh. <laughs>